There are three words in the Arabic language that I'd like to analyze. At-ta'amul, at-tafakkur, and at-tadabbur. See, most of us would say, those of you who know Arabic, would see all three of them as basically being synonymous. Meaning, to ponder, to contemplate, to reflect, to consider, something along these lines. However, these words do have differences. And so I'd like to explain what they are and why they are important for us to understand. So, to help understand this idea, let's put ourselves in a scenario. I want you to imagine that there's some sort of new device that some company wants to start selling. And so they hire you as an expert analyst to take a look at this thing. And so, what do you do? The first step is what? The first thing that you do is that you visit the company, you look at the product, you see how it works, you take notes, and you make observations. You make observations with the hope, and I emphasize the word hope, with the hope of understanding it. This first stage is all called what? At-ta'amul. Ta'amul. Why? Because it's to observe something, the initial stage of staring at it and trying to understand it, to hope that you'll understand it. And why do I say the word hope? Because ta'amul comes from the root word amal. And amal means hope. And so that's what a ta'amul means. It means to stare at something, to try to understand it, with the hope of understanding it. And so you're trying to make these helpful observations. That's stage one. What's stage two? You leave the company. You walk away from the product. And now you are driving home. And you're still thinking about it. And then let's say you're eating dinner, but you're still thinking about it. You wake up in the morning, you have breakfast, and you're still thinking about it. You may, you're thinking about what I may have missed, what extra observations can I make? Why? Because you're a perfectionist, and you're obsessed with your work. And plus, the device is extremely fascinating. So there's lots to reflect over, about. There's lots to reflect over. This is called what? At-tafakkur. At-tafakkur. Why? Because it comes from the root word what? Fikrah. And a fikrah is a thought. So you're constantly not staring at it, not hoping to understand it, ta'amul, that's stage one. Now this is stage two, you're reflecting over it and giving it lots and lots of thought, even when you're not directly engaged with the device in question. What is the third stage? The third stage is to ponder its consequences. To think not just about the device, but to think about its consequences. To consider many different questions, such as, how will this product impact the economy? Once they start selling it, once they start, you know, mass producing this thing, what's going to happen? Will it put other companies out of business? How will it impact society? Will it change the way we communicate? The way we learn? Will it change the way we transport things? Will it uh, take lots of time from our day? Will there be psychological ramifications? Will some people become addicted to it? How will our behavior change now that this new device has been thrust upon us in society? This is, this is called what? At-tadabbur. To think about the consequences or the impact of a thing. How will it affect us in the end? And I emphasize the word end because the word tadabbur comes from dubur. And dubur means the backside of something, the tail end, the last part of something, of something. When you're speaking about a human anatomy, the rear end is considered what? The dubur, the end of something. So this is what it implies. What is the end result? What are the consequences of this device? So now that I have broken down these three words, and I hope you can appreciate that when we throw out these words, we should understand the layers of nuance to them. Now, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, how do we implement these three layers of contemplation to the Qur'an? What is part one? I'm sure you all remember. It's at-ta'amul, the initial observations with the hope of understanding. We know that Allah Ta'ala commands us, the very first word of the Qur'an, the very first command that we receive is what? Iqra. Allah Ta'ala sent this incredible word to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explaining what? You need to read, engage with the Qur'an directly. Iqra' bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read and recite this Qur'an in the name of your Lord who created. This implies many different implications, such as what? Not, should, not only should you read it, but you should read it with tajweed. Learn to properly pronounce the letters. Also, take the time to look at each word and try to understand the Arabic. You could dive deeply into the dictionaries to understand the subtleties of language. You need to read it regularly. You need to, even to the point of repetition and memorization. And in addition to that, when you recite the Qur'an, how does Allah command us to recite the Qur'an? Allah says, وَرَتِّلِ الْقُرْآنَ تَرْتِيلًا That you should recite the Qur'an in a slow, rhythmic tone. You should not just rush, rush through it. 
You should not read the Qur'an in order to finish it. Yes, of course, there's barakah in reading every letter. And yes, it's beautiful to go over the Qur'an many times, alhamdulillah. But that being said, it should not replace the important job of what? Reflecting and thinking about and analyzing and understanding this Qur'an. We should interact with the verses as well, as is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. We know that, subhanAllah, Hudayf ibn al-Yaman, he says what? He described the Prophet ﷺ during his night prayers. He would stand, and, there was a specific occasion where he was standing and, and praying with the Prophet ﷺ late at night. And he recounted this, and he mentioned at one portion, he said, إِذَا مَرَّ بِآيَةٍ فِيهَا تَسْبِيحٌ سَبْحَ When he came across an ayah, a verse that was praising Allah, he would praise Allah. He would take a moment after, he'd recite, recite, and then just take under his breath, whisper a little glorification of Allah, praise of Allah. And also, وَإِذَا مَرَّ بِسُؤَالٍ سَأَلَ When you come across an ayah where there was something to ask, you would ask. وَإِذَا مَرَّ بِتَعَوَّذٍ تَعَوَّذَ When you come across a verse of a threat, he would, or some sort of something to take refuge in Allah from, he would take refuge in Allah. So you can imagine coming across ayat where Allah is mentioning the beauties of paradise, and you keep on just pausing and say, oh Allah. Let me arrive in paradise. Oh Allah, enter me amongst uh, the believers. You make a quick dua. Then you come across ayat of threat, ayat of adab, ayat of punishment. Oh Allah, protect me from this punishment. So you're interacting with this Qur'an. This is an active relationship with the Qur'an, clearly paying attention. And what is the second portion? Now that you've, you're engaging with the ta'amulat, with the reflections, observations upon this Qur'an, I should say. What's the second portion? At-tafakkur. At-tafakkur is to ponder it intellectually. Think about the Qur'an and study it the same way you would study any subject you enter into university. Think about the way we deal with a university subject. You take it very seriously. You pay big money so you can sit with professional teachers, go over the homework. You always do your homework on time because you want good grades. Imagine treating the Qur'an with that level of seriousness. This is an objective that we should have. So how would you go about this? Think about grad school. Any of you, any of you who have been to grad school, they always want to start with, okay, let's think about the historical context of this subject. And how would we understand the historical context of this Qur'an? We would study the seerah, the life of the Prophet ﷺ. Find out what circumstances each surah was revealed in. When were these surahs sent down? What was it addressing? How are the believers dealing with their circumstances, dealing with the disbelievers? What questions did they have? What answers were being given in these ayat? You should read the ahadith about these verses of the Qur'an. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ talks directly about certain ayat, and other times the Prophet ﷺ mentions things that have to do with the subject of those ayat. So you want to analyze all of this. You want to read the commentary from the earliest generations and even the contemporary ones as well. You want to see how throughout time people have observed these ayat and how they understand the fiqh ruling. Sometimes, subhanAllah, you understand an ayah, you read through it many times, you understand it, and then you see that there's commentary about it, extracting rulings, extracting fiqh, extracting law that you would otherwise never have seen. You'd be like, subhanAllah, look how clever, look how brilliant these people are that they can extract rulings and say, well, based on this verse, we can conclude this is halal or this is haram. Sometimes you're, you're blown away at the incredible conclusions people make. This is all these reflections that are not directly engaged with the Qur'an, but observations about it. Furthermore, you want the textual context. Uh, the, yes, why is it not only the historical context, but the textual? Why does Allah go from one subject to the next? Allah was just talking about paradise. Then the next subject in this, in this surah is about Musa alayhi salam. Then after that you find a story about Ibrahim alayhi salam. What's going on? Why, why jumping from one subject to the next? What is the reason here? It would be blasphemous to say that this is all, you know, just random. No, subhanAllah, nothing in the Qur'an is random. So, what is the historical context, but also the textual context? What is being said here? Why is it going from one subject to the other? These are all reflections we want to think about. And furthermore, what about the word choice? In the Qur'an, there are so many synonyms. You can find one concept being described with various different words, and these synonyms aren't perfect synonyms. They don't have the exact same meaning. They always have a different flavor. Just like these words, ta'amulat, tafakkurat, tadabburat. These words, they seem like synonyms, but yet they have different flavors, different ideas based on their roots. So in the same way, why does Allah choose one word here and one, not another word there? This is part of reflecting on the Qur'an. Allah Ta'ala mentions how we're supposed to reflect on the Qur'an when Allah says what? وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ ذِكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِلَ إِلَيْهِمْ وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ So here's that word, tafakkur. Allah says what? Allah says, and we have revealed to you the message. We have, Allah has revealed to you, O Muhammad Sallallahu this message. This Qur'an has been sent to you. Why? So that you may make clear to the people what was sent down to them. In other words, Allah could have sent a book just directly. But no, instead Allah sends a book with, upon a man, upon a messenger, who is going to be a living example, a walking Qur'an. A living example so that we can 
understand it. So through his life, through his words, through his actions, through his approvals, through him we understand this book. And this is the combination of what? Quran and Sunnah. And so Allah is saying, we have sent this book upon you so that you may clarify it. Now that the believers have this package of both Qur'an and Sunnah, now what can they do? لَعَلَّهُمْ That perhaps, perchance, some of them will take this seriously and say what? Now I can reflect. Now I can understand how to apply, how, how to live this Qur'an in my life. And how this, uh, how this Qur'an can be understood through the life of the Prophet And then, that's the Qur'an in general. That's, that's a verse telling us that we need to do tafakkur in general about the whole Qur'an. What about more specifically? In addition to the whole Qur'an in, in general, then there's specific portions of the Qur'an we need to focus on. Allah says what? فَقْصُصِ الْقَصَصَ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Again, that word comes up. Allah says, so relate the stories that perhaps these people will give thought. What is this implying? That as, as believers, we need to reflect upon the Qur'an in general, but now even more specifically, we're supposed to reflect upon what? The stories. The stories of Musa a.s. The stories of Nuh alayhi salam, the stories of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the stories of Ashab al-Kahf, the, stories of Dhul, the story of Dhul Qarnayn, and so on and so forth. The story of Yusuf alayhi salam, and, 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 the, story, the, the, the list goes on. All of these stories are supposed to be highlighted in your mind, in your life, and ask yourself, what extra observations am I supposed to make when I go through this Qur'an? How am I supposed to understand this? How can I reflect about this? Not just when I'm reading it directly, but even when I'm driving, even when I'm, I don't know, whatever I'm doing in life, going for a walk, whatever I'm doing, I need to reflect about this as well. And another highlighted portion of the Qur'an that Allah specifies that we need to do more reflection on is what? Allah says, وَتِلْكَ الْأَمْثَالُ نَضْرِبُهَا لِلنَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ These are the examples that we sent forth to the people that perhaps they will give thought. The amthal. The amthal. What is a method? Allah Ta'ala gives many different amthal, many different examples in the Qur'an. You're reading Surah Al-Baqarah and right near the beginning of the Qur'an you come across, Allah says that the munafiqeen, the hypocrites are like those who they're walking and then the lightning strikes and they take a step forward and they stop. What is this referring to? Why is a hypocrite like a person when the lightning comes off? What does that mean? What does this imply? And then as you continue through Baqarah, there are other amthal, there are other examples. And Allah says what? Darab Allahu mathalan. Over and over again, Allah says, Darab Allahu mathalan. Allah strikes an example. Darab means to hit. The idea is that, is that it's a striking example. It's supposed to hit you and have an impact. And so when Allah is highlighting and saying, well, first and foremost, in general, you're supposed to reflect over this whole Qur'an. But now specifically the stories. And then in addition to that, the examples. Are you paying extra attention and focusing on them? We need to think about this as well, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. And the third portion is what I'm going to talk about in the second khutbah of sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, salam kathira. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa sallam, ala rasulullah. So the first part was what? at taamul the basic observations. The second point was what? Reflection. at tafakkur fikrah, giving thought to it. What is the third portion? at tadabbur coming from dubur, meaning the end of something. Thinking about what? Understanding the Qur'an consequentially. That's the idea, consequentially. What are the consequences of this Qur'an? So part of this includes what? Think of the Qur'anic relevance with regards to many different things. For instance, popular social issues of the day. What are the hot topics that people are talking about nowadays? What are some big issues in society that people are debating about? That people find, you know, there's lots of disagreement about? You're supposed to do what? You're supposed to say, okay, well, what is the Qur'anic perspective? How does the Qur'an deal with this? This is one thing. Furthermore, the political climate. There are different political things that come and go all the time. What is the, Quran, what is the Qur'anic reflection or perspective on this? How do we consider the Qur'an in light of what we are living in currently? On a personal level, do you notice the descriptions of people around you? Allah Ta'ala gives lots of descriptions about who are the believers, who are the hypocrites, who are the righteous, who are the narcissists, who are the disbelievers, who are the heedless, who are the arrogant, who are the sincere, who are the humble. And what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to pay close attention to these descriptions and start seeing these realities around you. Start seeing these qualities in the people around you. How unfortunate, how blind we are if all we see is what? Oh, this person has this color and that person has that color. Oh, mashallah. Even a baby can figure that out. Color tones, big deal. You're supposed to be an adult and see things with a true believer's eye and understand on a deeper level what this person represents. You're not supposed to be worried about shade. Subhanallah. In the summertime, I get darker because of my tan. Then in the wintertime, I get lighter. Does that change my... What, what does that change? Subhanallah, we need to grow up. This is ridiculous. You have to start seeing with the lens of the Qur'an and start understanding who are the different people. What does it mean that a person is from amongst the fujjar? 
What does it mean that this person is a fasiq? What does it mean that the person is a muhsin? What does it mean that they are muttaqi? What does it mean that they are part of the al-abrar? What are these descriptions of different people, good or bad? How can I see them from amongst me? How can I stay away from one category, or certain categories and get closer to the other categories? How can I be amongst these types of people? If all we do is categorize people based off of dunyawi categories, worldly categories, oh, this person speaks this language, he's from that country, he's from this color, and we're neglecting the way Allah Ta'ala categorizes people, then we are not doing what? at tadabburat We are not reflecting, we are not uh, considering the Qur'an as we should. This Qur'an provides us harmony. As Allah says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ, مِنْ عِنْدِي غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اِخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Allah Ta'ala says what? Do they not consider the Qur'an? Do they not do tadabbur on this Qur'an? If it had been from any other than Allah, they would have found within it much contradictions. This is a beautiful ayah. Because there's, there's layers of meaning here. The first surface layer is very clear. This Qur'an, if it was from other than Allah, you'd be able to go and find this contradicts this, this contradicts that, very straightforward. It's obviously not from God, because God doesn't contradict Himself. Straightforward. But there's a deeper meaning implied as well. The secondary meaning is what? That think about it. If this Qur'an had a bunch of contradictions, then those contradictions would be manifest in those people trying to apply it. So, just to give an example, imagine if there is a boss giving contradictory instructions to the company. What's going to happen to that company? All the people working underneath them, they're all going to fail. The company's going to fail. How can, how can they implement contradictory instructions? So ask yourself this very important and deep question. When you practice Islam, does life become more chaotic? Or do you find more peace and harmony with the people around you? And furthermore, what about on a societal level? When a whole country, when a whole city, when a whole, I don't know, group of people, large portions of society, when they all start to increase in their practice of Islam, if this Islam was contradictory, if this Islam had contradictory instructions, what would you find? Chaos. And subhanAllah, throughout human history, what do you find? As the Muslims don't apply their deen, chaos. The moment they start to apply their deen, harmony, peace, blessings in the land. SubhanAllah. So Allah is saying, do you not reflect over this Qur'an? If it was from other than Allah, you'd find contradictions in the book. But in addition to that, you'd find contradictions in those people who are trying to apply it as well as a residual effect. So I hope we understand this. This is part of tadabbur. Reflecting on the Qur'an and realizing the beautiful impact that it has. Ask yourself, how does this Qur'an affect me? What is the end result of this Qur'an upon me? Allah says what? وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَيُعَلِّمْكُمُ الله. Fear Allah and Allah is going to keep teaching you. The more you fear Allah and implement this deen, the more its, its, its secrets are going to reveal itself. The more these practices are going to become manifest, the beauty of it in your life. So have more taqwa, have more practice and application of Allah's deen, you will find, alhamdulillah, things just open up for you. Allah says what? يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِن تَتَّقُوا اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ فُرْقَانًا Oh, you have believed, if you fear Allah, if you practice this deen, if you implement, implement it in your life, He will grant you a criterion. That means what? Things will become clear for you. Life is going to become simpler. You know, sometimes people, they're going through life, I don't know what, should I go left, should I go right? Should I go up, should I go down? I don't know what to do. I'm stuck at a crossroads. I don't know what to do in my life. SubhanAllah, Allah is saying what? Apply this deen, apply this Qur'an in your life. Have taqwa of Allah. Allah is going to make things furqan. You're going to see the farq. Bainahuma. You're going to see the, the, the difference between the two paths. It's going to be very clear to you. So the question you have to ask yourself is, what is holding you back? What is more important than reflecting upon the Qur'an? Allah says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ Again, this word, tadabbur. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Allah says, do they not reflect upon the Qur'an, or is it that their hearts are locked up? There are many different ways to understand this ayah, but one way is that Allah is saying, what is your heart locked onto? Are you locked onto Netflix, and that's why you can't pick up the Qur'an? Are you locked onto these different songs that you listen to in the car, that's why you can't lock onto the Qur'an? Are you locked onto gossip? and just chilling and hanging out? Are you locked onto these movies and these shows? What is it that is occupying your time that your heart is so attached to, addicted to, locked onto, that is replacing your time with the Qur'an to reflect and understand and contemplate and consider how to apply this deen? What is it? What is wrong? What are you addicted to? You have to ask, Allah is asking, a question demands an answer. Ask yourself, why is it that it's so hard for us to understand even a little bit when the Imam is leading the Salah? We don't even understand the short surahs. Why? How is it possible that we have kids that subhanAllah they get sent to the Qur'an class at the age of, I don't know, 8, 9, 10, 12, whatever years old, and they can't even recite Fatiha, they can't even recite the three Qul surahs at the very basics. SubhanAllah, when they were kids, they were memorizing little songs and daycare nursery rhymes. Parents were playing this and playing that. 
Subhanallah, the parents are, are able to make them memorize whatever they want to memorize, and yet no time for the Qur'an? Are you sure it was a good idea? Were you really ready to have children? If this is, if this is the attitude, are you sure you were ready for this? Those of you who don't have kids, ask yourself, why do I want to bring life into this world just so there can be another set of eyes attached to the television? Just to experience what it's like to go through the highs and lows of this addiction to entertainment. Oh, it's funny, haha, and now I feel depressed again. Oh, I'm, I'm entertained, now I feel depressed again. Is this, if this is what you're going through, you want to pass this on to your kids? Subhanallah. Bring this Qur'an, let's bring this Qur'an into our lives so that when we bring new life into this world, inshallah ta'ala, we have something that they can truly appreciate. Part of the consequences of this Qur'an is that we remind people with the Qur'an, not only just to study it, but then to use it to remind others. This is part of the consequence. Allah says, نَحْنُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا يَقُولُونَ We know even better what they are saying. In other words, the Prophet was receiving lots of people throwing doubts at him. What about this? What about that? What about this? And Allah is saying, I know all their arguments. Don't worry about it. نَحْنُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا يَقُولُونَ I know even better what all the doubts, all the different things that people are going to say. I know all the arguments. وَمَا أَنْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِجَبَّارٍ And you can't force them. That's not your job. Your job is not to enforce people to believe. So what can you do? If they have all these arguments, and I can't force them to believe, what can I do instead? Allah says what? فَذَكِّرْ بِالْقُرْآنِ مَا يَخَافُ وَعِيدٍ So remind, by this Qur'an, through this Qur'an, just remind people. Why? I know all the arguments. I know all the arguments, and this Qur'an is going to be able to answer everything that you need. So remind people through the Qur'an. Do we have the ability, brothers and sisters, do we reflect upon this Qur'an enough so that when we're in a discussion, I say, oh, that reminds me of this ayah or that ayah, that I can just, off the top, just come up with various ayat? Allah musta'an. Allah Ta'ala tells us that this is the Qur'an we need to settle disputes with. وَمَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ إِلَّا لِتُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ تُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ الَّذِي اِخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ And we have not revealed to you this book, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We did not reveal to you except to make clear to them that which they are differing in. Every time people are having a debate, discussion, disagreeing, fighting, so forth, you're, as the believer, you say what? What does the Qur'an say about this? How can I approach this from a Qur'anic perspective? That's now implementing this concept of tadabbur. We should treat the Qur'an as a personal message. Al-Hasan ibn Ali Ra'an, he said what? إِنَّ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلَكُمْ رَأَوَ الْقُرْآنَ رَسَائِلَ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَكَانُوا يَتَدَبَّرُونَهَا بِالْلَّيْلِ وَيَتَفَقَّدُونَهَا فِي النَّهَارِ Those who came before you, they saw the Qur'an as a message from their Lord, a personalized message to them. You don't neglect the text message or the letter that was sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't neglect it. It's, you, they treat it like it was personal. So what do they do? They would contemplate it during the night and they would miss it during the day. Imagine, they'd pray at night going over the Qur'an and during the daytime, man, I can't wait, I can't wait to get back. I was just reading Ibn Kathir, I was reading this tafsir, I was listening to these lectures, I was going over Qur'an, I was reflecting and understanding, I can't wait to get back to my Qur'an. This is the attitude that the early generations had. Yes, we need to treat the Qur'an like there's always more to discover. And so I wanted to mention all this, why? Because brothers and sisters, the Lord of Ramadan is the, is the same Lord in every other month. This is the main issue. We just came out of the, the month of Ramadan. Alhamdulillah, we had a whole month of Qur'an. This is not the time to now, what? Throw the Qur'an behind your back and say, oh, I guess I'll see you next year. That is not the objective. The objective is what? To keep up with at ta'amul at tafakkur and at tadabbur So, please, make this dua with me. Allahumma ja'alna min ahlil Qur'an. Allahumma ja'alna min ahlil Qur'an. اللهم اجعلنا من أهل القرآن وخاصته اللهم اجمع القرآن في قلوبنا حفظا وعلى ألسنتنا تلاوة وفي سلوكنا خلقا وارزقنا منه العلم والعمل And I'll say that in English for those who do not understand Oh Allah, make us from the people of the Quran Make us from the people of the Quran Make us from the people of the Quran and your special servants Oh Allah, place this Quran in our hearts through memorization and on our tongues through recitation and in our lives through implementation and provide us its knowledge and its action Amin Ya Rabbil Alameen